So good evening. Uh, my name is Ravi Lango. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, thanks for uh, deciding to spend a good half one plus hour um, on a busy uh, business day um, in this forum. What I'll do now is spend next one hour, about an hour or something, introducing you to deep learning, PyTorch, with some demos. That's what I'm going to do. Um, before I start off, um, how many of you are familiar with deep learning, have done, have been practicing um, data science, those kind of things? All right, okay. All right, I may go into some basics also to start with. And uh, since we have enough time, let's make it interactive. Feel free to ask me questions and we'll go with that flow, okay? All right. The worst thing I can do is I would say that I don't know. That's the worst thing I can do. So feel free to ask questions along the way. Uh, this is my bio. I think I yeah, went we through this. My current job is a principal data scientist at State's title in SF, and we are also hiring. If anybody is interested, let us know. Mostly in the NLP area. Uh, okay. All right. So let's start with some basics here. Um, so what's deep learning? Um, deep learning is, is a subset of machine learning. You start off with the artificial intelligence, um, which is basically um, making machi machine behave like humans, right? Machine learning is machine learns from previous activities and tries to do this without by itself. And deep learning is just one algorithm which does it pretty well in certain areas. It does very well in, in, uh, in image processing, audio processing, and natural language processing, right? In all these areas, deep, uh, deep learning has proved that it's, it can do pretty well. Um, some of the artificial intelligence um, applications, you see this in a day-to-day -day life. You see Netflix, Pandora, um, what is this, it's Alexa, all these kind of devices, mostly around test um, uh, speech recognition, and image recognition, it does, in, it, it does wonderful things on a day-to-day -day basis. Today it's happening, right? Uh, three, four years ago, people are just saying that it might happen, those kind of things, not four years ago, at least four, six years ago. Now it's actually the whole thing is happening, which is pretty good. So let's talk about what machine learning is. Um, so most of you are practicing data scientists, which is pretty good. It's all about finding patterns, patterns in data, and it uses statistical learning. Okay, so you uh, feed it, by, feed the system a bunch of uh, data points. It learns from from it, and it starts using it again uh, when a new new data point is given. That's pretty much what machine learning is all about. Uh, this again basics. Uh, just stay with me here. I just want to make sure everybody is on board. Um, basically, in terms of a supervised learning, what you do is you take label data, and uh, a machine learning algorithm learns from it. And using a learned model, it actually does a prediction. Let's take an example. A label data could be um, images on the stores, in the retail stores, showing different uh, kind of products. And for every product, there's an image and there's an answer. Feed that information into a machine learning algorithm, it will figure out the relationship between the data and what the answer is going to be. It will learn it and keep the, keep the algorithm within itself. Right? Then when you provide a new product, it's going to tell you what it is. It's going to tell you it's a banana or, or whatever. Right? And you start using it in business for whatever reason you want to do. That's the basics of machine learning. And deep learning is just one algorithm which does very well in certain areas. Um, again, um, this, is, this is a mathematical way of simplistic way of seeing it. In machine learning le uh, training, there is an input x. Um, there is a model which does the prediction. The prediction is based on a function. Function means it's got a lot of parameters and a funky equation. And that particular search, that particular parameters needs to be searched based on your training data, right? Uh, the way it does is you do something called a loss calculation and you try to uh, find the best parameters for the model. Um, is everybody here familiar with the basics of machine learning? loss, optimization, okay, I'll just skip all those kind of things. All right, we went through this, this is good. So again, applications, speech recognition, computer vision, and so natural language processing. Computer vision, this is clearly, it is uh, deep learning has proved itself. There is a lot of applications in productions today. I'm not talking about what Google or Facebook, these kind of companies are doing. They are actually having the product as part of their product, right? I'm talking about in business corporations where they're using these computer vision to do business activities, 
that is started happening now, right? For that to happen, they need, people naturally has to use, they have to use a lot of frameworks for doing this particular training. And um, the currently, the kind of frameworks people use, they use TensorFlow, Keras, Cafe, uh, quite a bunch of things, MXNet and PyTorch. And today I want to focus on PyTorch. And uh, the reason I want to focus on that is I've used TensorFlow, I've used Tensor, uh, Keras. In my recent company in Fogon, when I was working, on, working there, um, I had to solve a manufacturing problem, right? I, I'll walk you through some of the examples. I cannot share the code or something, whatever we did there, but along those lines, I have some example I can share it with you, um, which, will, which, will, which, which is why I'm just excited about using PyTorch, right? So it made it so easy to use in a, in a commercial manufacturing defect detection application. Um, I thought Keras was it. Keras was like, how many people use Keras here? Okay, do you like it? Good. So it's because it's like English. You don't have to worry about a lot of different things, right? Uh, so I like Keras. I used to teach this class before. I always ask people, hey, you should use Keras and other things, but it had some limitations. But if you want to do some custom stuff, it's always difficult to do. Um, but if you start using PyTorch, it's one level easier than that. It's much, much easier. And um, one, somebody, one gentleman was asking me, why do you think PyTorch is better than um, uh, TensorFlow or something like that is, since I started using PyTorch, I rarely go to Stack Overflow. That kind of speaks for itself. So you don't spend time in APIs and, and fixing all the unnecessary problems, especially you are an, if you are an applied data scientist. Right? If you're an applied data scientist, you're worrying about solving your business problems, right? That's the way you're going to focus on as opposed to worrying about APIs and other technical issues. PyTorch is so, so easy to do. So I'm so excited about it. So I'm not, I'm not taking money from Facebook or PyTorch. That's, that's not the reason I'm saying it. I really found it very, very useful in my previous company. Even my current company, I'm planning on using it. Again, for natural language processing, again, PyTorch is again useful. Uh, deep learning itself is, is, is very useful in natural language processing, and I see um, in terms of job opportunities, if people are learning deep learning, um, uh, the computer vision is kind of saturated. Everybody using uh, a school kid can come and create an image classification model, right? They can do it in no time. Uh, but natural language processing is now getting, getting there. And, and pretty much every corporation, when they want automated stuff, they need solutions with using natural language processing. So if you want to spend time in learning new stuff, think about NLP. <clears throat> Again, deep learning basics. Do you guys want me to go through this? Yes. OK. So it's, it's, um, it's all about, or I, I told you about a machine learning model is about uh, postulating that this particular problem can be solved with a function, right? And, and, and setting up the function, then figuring out what exactly the parameters are. And uh, in terms of deep learning basics, it kind of was um, inspired by neurons. Neurons are in our brains. The way neurons work is it gets impulses as input. And if you see all the tendrons on this side, um, the, these are all the inputs coming through. And it provides an output, right? And it, it gives kind of different priorities based on what, it, what inputs it's getting and figures out an output. Kind of, right? It's continuous function. That's what it does. And equivalent to that, if you want to talk about an artificial neuron, you can see how many inputs are there, x1 and x2. There are two inputs there, right? And there's the one more, um, uh, oh, sorry, three inputs, x0, x1, and x2. And plus, there is a bias. Let's, let's forget about that for a second. There are three inputs coming in. All the three inputs are multiplied by some kind of weights, W0, W1, and W2, which means it's given relative different importance based on whatever it is. And it's going to come up with, with an output, right? Now, let's assume that these three inputs define an image or something, right? The three inputs, it would be x1, x2, x3, or it could be every pixel in an image, which could be thousands of number uh, values. If you have things coming in, and magically you figure out the right, right weights to apply and come up with an answer, then you're done. You have a function which is going to provide you the output we need, right? And the key is, how do you figure out the W0 and W1 and W2, which is going to solve your problem? That's where the parameter search comes into picture, and you use backward propagation, deep learning, and, sorry? Be careful your <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that, okay. 
Is anybody um, logged in or something? Everybody is here physically? Nobody is remote, right? Okay, all right. In my last year meetup, some people were logged in from Seattle or something. Okay, so that's basically the, uh, the weights get determined, which is we call it as a parameter search in statistics. Okay, go ahead. 37 is your, or 37. Online. Online. Oh, okay, great. Okay. All right, great. So the parameter search or backward propagation makes sure that all the parameters w1, w0, w1, w2 are figured out so that you, it gives you the function gives you the answer you need. And it is not a single neuron, uh, neuron which is going to solve the problem. You want to make life difficult. The neural network model will look up something like this. So these are all the inputs. Whatever you see on the left hand side, these are all the inputs. This could be again pixels or some other business parameters, anything, any variables. And all these are sent to the next, next layer. And every one of these, um, the second layer, whatever circle you see, that's a node, that is a neuron. It does the same computation what I talked about. And again, the output of that is sent to the next layer, again the same computation. If you really want to formulate the final output in terms of input, it'd be really a funky equation. Can you imagine that? Too many parameters with all kinds of uh, stuff. In addition, the, the output activation could also be a nonlinear function. So to make things worse. So that's a, such a complex equation you have got. And the backward propagation nicely works to make sure that it finds the right parameters so that you can get your output. Are we okay here? Okay. And the foundation of any deep learning platform is basically the backward propagation, figuring out the partial derivative, those kind of things so that it can do the parameter search for you. So TensorFlow has the built-in capability. Similarly, PyTorch. All these are fundamental, that's the cream. That's the secret sauce, right? No, not secret sauce, but that's the cream. Foundation. How do they do the backward propagation? Come up with the right, uh, right parameters. Everything else doesn't matter. Once you have that, um, the, the function figured out, the parameters figured out, then it becomes like any other model any other um, uh, random forest or, or logistic regression or any other model. Any questions here so far? Good. It's all basics. Sorry about um, going through this again. The equations looks really funky if you really come up with the final y2 in, ter in terms of x1 and x2, it will be a really a funky equation. Uh, that's what this, this is supposed to illustrate. I'm not going to go through all those kind of things now. Okay. All right, let's talk about a simple task in computer vision. Again, I'm going through some basics again. Please bear with me. Uh, just to make sure that you guys get the, the image classification clearly in your head. So this is the, on the left hand side, you have the input image. On next, what you see is the pixel representation of the image. Basically, the computer sees this as a pixel representation. It just sees numbers, 0 through 255. Uh, assume this is a gray, gray pixel, so you have only one layer. You see some numbers. That's the only thing it sees. It doesn't see anything else. And magically, there is a classification arrow. That's where the ML comes in. Your deep learning model comes in. It somehow converts these numbers into a set of probabilities of possible four classes. And I'll be using these kind of terms. terms of the possible target classes are Lincoln, Washington, Jefferson, and Obama. It comes up with a probability for every one of them. How it does it using, using that function which I talked about. And you figure out using a using lot of training, giving it a lot of images, you it figures out the right parameters, and finally you have a function which provides you the right probability here. Here it says 0.8 for Lincoln, and you say, ah, this should be Lincoln. And it is Lincoln, right? So that's how the computer vision problems are solved. Um, again, not to bore you too much, this is how it works. Your um, uh, pixel representation is fed into the first row. The first row has only six nodes. Actually, it is supposed to have a number of nodes should equal the number of pixel values coming in, including a bias, right? Then it has got multiple hidden layers, but it goes through complex calculations. And finally, output layer spits out the probability, right? That's what it's doing. And um, coming to think of it, this is basically a computational graph. The, the, the neural network model is nothing but a computational graph. And that's what you define when you define a model. Okay, so far, whenever we say that we're defining a model, we are going to define a computational graph with unknown parameters. Then you train and figure out the right parameters. All right, now I'm jumping. 
I'm going to use some words CNN, assume you guys know, but I'm not going to go into the details. If you come to the Saturday class, we will go through this in step by step. Um, CNNs for classification, it is something called convolutions instead of straight away using the pixels in a branded way. You actually look at the pixels 3 by 3 or 4 by 4, those kind of things because the, the where the pixels are makes a difference to a 2D image. So it provides better information and it goes through multiple layers. On the left hand side, you only see an input, it's a car, it's a two dimensional image. And it goes through these, whatever you see, all these cubes kind of a thing, three dimensional, they're all basically layers, different layers. It goes through different layers, all the computations are formed like the way I explained before, and ultimately it's going to give you a classification of, I don't know whether you can see properly or not, the classification are car, truck, van, there are some thousand classes. That is what it's going to give, okay, all the computation. The initial layers are called feature learning. The way it does internally to intuitively to understand how the image processing works is it takes a look at the image here and it first initial layers, they look at slashes or curves, dots. It basically looks at the basic, basic strokes used in drawing the pictures. That's what is coming out here. And as you go along, it puts, puts the pic pictures together, all the shapes together and finally tries to figures out what kind of a shape or what kind of a, uh, image it is, and from there it does the classification. That's how the whole learning is done, right? Um, and if you, um, I'll come to this later. Let's look at this picturization. Uh, this is how it normally works. Depending on the problem here, we are, we are providing a bunch of three dimensions, sorry, color uh, image of a pe person, and we are trying to detect something with the face. That's what we're trying to do. I don't know what exactly the problem is, but that's what we're trying to do. All the layers we see are the different deep learning layers where computation is done based on the pixel values. If you see the initial layers, you see all the dashes and the basic strokes are getting detected. The next one is nose, eye, it's putting together small pieces. And finally, the face is it's, it's, it's actually figuring out the different feature, features which will formulate the face, and finally, with that information, you start providing, uh, you try start uh, detecting whatever you are supposed to detect. Does it make sense? That's how the whole learning piece is done. The reason I'm going through this is, I'm coming to transfer learning here, right? Um, so this is how the whole network is going to look like. You start off with a car, you have a bunch of feature learning, which is basically all the curves and everything, then you put things together, which is called a classification couple of three layers, which is a classification layer, you flatten the, the CNN, then you make it as a fully connected, um, when you say fully connected, all the nodes are connected to each and every node. Then you have a softmax, which produce, introduces a non-linearity, and it produces a probability for every one of those classes. That's the last piece. And that's how the uh, uh, typical CNN training is done. Uh, on the bottom you see, that's called the loss. Loss is the one which basically, um, guides the, um, the framework through backward propagation and as well as making, the, making sure you get the right parameters. Let's stay with that at this point. Now, let's talk about transfer learning for a second, right? I'll, I'll go back and forth on this. Transfer learning. So, if at all, if it, number, the one problem I had in my previous company was we didn't have a lot of data. Right? It was a manufacturing defect detection problem. Right? We didn't have a lot of data. But we had to do a defect detection. We had to create a defect detection model. So when people are doing uh, training with ImageNet, let's go through some of the ImageNet problems here. Um, so ImageNet data set is being sponsored by Google, uh, Stanford, and Princeton University, and all those kind of people. And they have 14 million images across 21 plus uh, K categories. So they got so many images in ImageNet. So they created models which would classify an image to one of these objects, whether it's a banana or, or whatever, mango, those kind of things. And they could do it because they have 40 million images. And people like you and me, we don't have access to 40 million images. If you go to any manufacturing company, first of all, we ask them training data, they'll ask, 
what are you talking about, right? They, they don't even have time to do their work in terms of manufacturing goods. Forget about uh, uh, capturing uh, images and actually labeling and other things. Too much work for those kind of people. Even if they give, they're going to give you only 1,000 or 2,000 images. That's a lot of work, right? Especially if you're in the business of soliciting and basically you're pushing your solution, you don't get a lot of support for creating training, training data. Does anybody have that problem in their um, business, creating of training data? It's always a challenge, right? You never get the data. So in that situation, you don't have you don't have 40 million images. So what do you do, right? That's where the transfer learning helps. So this is from CS 231 course in Stanford. You can go and take a look at it. I'll just read through this. Very few people train an entire CNN network from scratch, right? Because they don't have data, right? So it's very common to pre-train a model using ImageNet. Right? When you pre-train a model using ImageNet, what do you get? You get, I'll go back and forth on this, when you pre-train a model using ImageNet, you get weights or parameters for every one of those layers trained for 40 million, uh, with 40 million uh, images. And remember, when the parameters are trained, what does it train for the first few layers? It's going to get, it's not going to get the car. It's going to look for the curves, straight lines and those kind of things, which is common for every application, right? If a, if a system knows how to get this information, why should I not use that piece alone? That's the idea of transfer learning. So the transfer learning, what you do is, you take this model, the complete model, the first few layers, which is feature learning model, one way to do the transfer learning, the multiple ways to do the transfer learning, I'm just talking about one. You, what you do is you take the feature learning you want to leverage of the work done by all these guys using ImageNet, you freeze the parameters, whatever they gave you, which means you have now have a model which can detect all the curves and small little pieces out of your, out of your image. Till, till what stage do you freeze? Typically all the feature learnings, all the convolution networks. So you mean all the way to your feature? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, to which layer do you freeze during for transfer learning, right? So if you take a look at a pre-trained model, it has got basically the feature learning, all the CNN network, the, uh, the, the CNN layers, and at, at the end, it will have a fully connected layer and probably a classification layer. You typically what you do is, wherever it is doing a generic feature learning, you freeze up to that point, right? Then later on, the rest of the images, you start train, the rest of the layers, you train using your data. Since it's a fewer data, say, fewer parameters needs to be trained, you don't need a lot of data. And it works well. Trust me, I was shocked to see the results when I ran this. Because we were working on that particular problem for one month or two months. Uh, trying to break our head to get some kind of accuracy using image segmentation, all those kind of wonderful things using TensorFlow. I dropped Keras because I didn't want to use it for some whatever reason. I went for TensorFlow and uh, after two months, within a, I had to, I want to try out PyTorch for something else. Accidentally I went for it. Within a week we had a solution. What was the problem? Which one? That was, that, was a, that was a manufacturing defect detection problem. It's a binary classification. Defect, yes or no. That's the only thing. Okay. In a, in a color, color, color image. It's not other. Okay, go ahead. Good question, I, I tried that. So the question is, um, typically all the pre-trained model are trained within color images, which is RGB images, which means your dimensions are 224 by 224 by three. That's how it is. And the whole model is set up to behave that way. Suppose your real life problem is, is a grayscale. So what do you do? Um, one thing I did was, I don't think I have the answer for it. I did a similar problem, I had to do it. What I did was I copied the grayscale into all the three three layers. It should work. I tried that solution, but is that like optimal or is that suboptimal? What do you think? Uh, it worked for me. 
it worked for me. I used it not for transfer learning. I used it for as part of the loss function. In the loss function, we were actually comparing not the, um, the classifier predicted output. We were comparing the output of VGC 16, fourth layer, 17th layer. That's what we were comparing. So it's, it's a different kind of a problem. At that time, I had to use, I was forced to use, I had to get to go to the same problem. I just copied it. It worked for me. So that's, that's um, so on. Any other questions? No. All right, very good. Um, so that's the key. Um, so you leverage of, uh, I'll tell you a few more ways to do the pre-training pre also, as we use the pre-trained model. This is one normally used way, which I have used it. There are other ways also. Um, let's, let's go through and see what the professor says here. Um, you can use it in two ways, that's what he says. There are, there are more ways, I'll come to one more, one more thing also. One is as an initialization. So it's not freezing. You just initialize using a pre-trained model and use a very low learning rate to train your 1,000 images or 2,000 images. It might work, it's an experiment. At the end of the day, deep learning training is, is an art. It's not really a science. You have to try different things to see which one works for you. That's very important. So you can, you can try this, but for me, this never worked for me, but this is something which you want to try. And the fixed feature extractor is what I told you before, which is basically fix the convolution network and then do it. Let's go back to this, the question you, you had asked. So I would uh, initially start with freezing all the feature learning and doing the classification, right? If I think if I have enough data, what I'll do is I'll start releasing the last of the feature learning layer. Are you following me? So I'll un when I say I freeze, freeze these feature learning, which means all the parameters there are fixed. And I can only change the parameters for the classification layer, right? That's one default, I'll see how the accuracy is. Then if I'm a little bit adventurous, what I'll do is the last layer of feature learning, I'll, I'll just unfreeze it and see whether it, that helps. So I can just keep doing it. What you cannot do is, you cannot select one middle layer somewhere here and say that I'm going to unfreeze this. You have to do it only from the end because that's bad propagation works like that with the chain rule, right? You, can, you can't skip certain things. I don't even know how it will behave if you do that. Are you okay so far? Okay, good. All right, so that's a wonderful uh, thing of um, um, uh, transfer learning. Again, let's take a look at the image link challenge. They got AlexNet, ZFNet, then VGG won the competition, GoogleNet, ResNet. I have successfully used a couple of ResNet layers in production in the last one year. I'm pretty uh, fond of it. So if classification, if you want to go for certain uh, problems I had to face where I had to do an image reconstruction, where there was the people gave a blurry image, we had scanned the images, and we had to reconstruct it. I tried every model, except for ResNet, nothing else worked. It was very, very powerful. So I would say that, give that a thought too. You can try everything, but ResNet is pretty good. Go the question is, um, you already trained the image with lots of objects, Unfortunately, bananas was not there, let's assume. Suddenly, bananas comes into picture, and suddenly this one comes into picture, what happens? Um, it's a straightforward thing. First of all, it will try to attempt to classify it to the extent it can. You can probably call it a cucumber or something, that's what it will probably do. Um, and, but it's actually your job as, as, as a person, it's a, a I think that's another thing industry is learning. Everybody is good at creating a model, but people haven't figured out how do you maintain a model in production? They have not figured it out. Everybody is throwing models out, hey, this is good 98% accuracy and other things, but how do you measure that it's maintaining that accuracy and you need to retrain? People have periodic retraining, that's one way to do that. And there is another thing which we introduced in our previous company called closed loop learning, where we look for data trips, right? In this case, it will be data drift. We will figure out that, hey, we haven't seen this kind of data before. It will say that, hey, your data has drifted, which means your model is no longer valid because it has not looked at this data. You have to go for a respin. So that's the way you start doing it. Um, either a periodic respin of the model or look for statistical data drifts. That's what you should do. That's very, very important. Very good question because this is something nobody is focusing on. People are now slowly learning how do you actually manage things in production. 
I'm pretty sure from now onwards you will see standard tools coming in for doing it. I don't think today there is a tool saying that, hey, this is how you should manage things in production. If you have, people have ideas, go ahead and develop it. What this tells you is whenever you see something um, um, doing better than humans, uh, this is a candidate for automation. If we can do speech recognition better than humans, yes, AI can do it, machines can do it, right? If it is just doing above humans, it's a hard sell to the business. Hey, I'm going to give you the application, but you have to deal with this extra failures. Nobody is going to buy it. Nobody cares about all your algorithms and other things, but they will tell you that, oh, this, this, this is giving me a worse performance, why should I do it? But if it's behaving better than humans, it's an easy sell. The, the, the data set has 21 categories. I think the, when you start using it for a classification, only 1,000 classes are available. Okay. <coughs> Next question. So, By the way, I'm not an expert in ImageNet. I have not trained this kind of thing. I'm a user of um, ImageNet pre-trained models. Go ahead. So whenever we have engineers whose uh, solution is not working, they always blame the data. They say, oh, you didn't give us enough data. So when do you know that you have enough data points? Or is it a problem with the model itself? Is it the it's a, is it a inferior model or we need more data? To spend time and money to get more data. So uh, as, as part of the model development, what you do is you have to come up with an expected accuracy expected prediction accuracy. And when you develop a model, you set aside a data set. Say, say 40% of the data set is a holdout data set. You say, keep it separate. Use the 60% of the data set for training. And use the 40% of the data which has not been seen by the model to do the prediction. And you say that, oh, this is 98% accurate, or 84% accurate, or 85% accurate. That's how you set the expectation that if I use this model in few, for future, this is my future data, my expected accuracy is 84%. That's important. People don't do a good job in setting up the expected accuracy properly, then they'll run into this problem. That's number one. Number two is the problem with this gentleman said, right? The data drifts after it going to production, right? Um, then, then what happens? So you should have a process for taking care of any data drifts so that you can start re-spinning re the models. Let me come back to you on the other end. So depending on the model, there is no easy way to think, check things in production. There is no easy way. It's all uh, anecdotal. There is no easy way, right? You, if you, there is clear way saying that our oh, train is going to crash, it doesn't crash. Those kind of things are easy way to measure. But if you want to see that how many times it did the detection properly or not, it's very, very difficult to measure in production. Very, very difficult to production. So I don't know that I'm answering your question or not. The, as, as a data scientist, even in developing the model, I need to set the expectation clearly, saying that based on the data what I have seen, this is my expected accuracy. As long as the new data which comes in is similar to my data distribution, it falls in the data distribution, I'm expected to see this accuracy. That should, that should mathematically and statistically, that should work. If your data distribution changes, the data scientist doesn't know about it. So you should have a process to deal with that. That's important. And if a data scientist done, didn't do a good job in calculating the model accuracy, then it's a different issue altogether. Okay. Is there any specific example you want to share with people or, or it is just a... So we have a solution where um, what we did is internally we had enough data and we saw some good results. Okay. Once we took it to production, sometimes it does a very good job and sometimes it just wasted time and you had to go back. And the, the production environment, people lose confidence. That's true. To use it again. That's true. That's true. Yeah, we, that's, that's a, that's a, um, you have to set the expectation right. Um, for any model, what I would say is set the expectation that, hey, this is, set a low bar on the expectation. Just, just go, go with the lower expectation. This is how it's going to behave. And you have a good way to measure whenever there is some outliers happening, right? 
and you should work with people for a month or two or depending whatever the time period is for getting the new data which is not getting labeled properly get that part of the training data set the accuracy can only go up it cannot go down in general generally speaking right so that is the change management process you need to work on again depending on the criticality of the application you need to decide how much upfront work you need to do if it is a business critical things like you are dead if something is wrong that is a completely different story there are other things where you have a backup process to work with if there is a problem then you have you have some time to make your models better um, so that's it's a subjective uh, question but it's important very good anything else the question is companies like paypal use these kind of models for figuring out uh, fraudsters fraudsters right and if the accuracy of the model is 94 percent how do they deal with this in the business right so again you, you, you when your accuracy in terms of just like you don't look at only the accuracy you lose some other measures like precision and recall not to confuse people it all depends on your particular business applications can you live with some false positives right um, because or, or other way around so what in this case um, they for a for a PayPal it's more important that they can even even be 80 percent accurate but they want to make sure that all the frauds are caught which means they'll have a lot of false positives which they can work around using manual or second level of review right in some situation they are okay with catching 98 percent two percent of the fraud because it's too expensive to take care of all the frauds two percent of the fraud if it goes through it's probably from business perspective it's okay with that so that's that's a business call but again it goes back to what the gentleman said is we have to make sure that the model accuracy has to be tuned with the business purpose uh, the, the end uh, business goal in mind so you can tweak for less false positives or more false positives all those things you can do as part of your model tweaking you can do that and you had set the expectation right that's important good question anything anything else okay all right this is again this story i don't know whether you get to go through this this is basically the same information shown in different way and uh, there's a lot of different models out there again uh, my favorites are all these uh, resonant models i used resonant 18 because uh, the previous company where i worked on we want to get a good speed that's when speed was very important for us because we had to process 40 images per second so fast we had to do so our scoring should be done in less than 10 milliseconds we came down to 8 milliseconds we used pytorch and we used open vino intel's open vino to get the right scoring scoring model we use 18 which means the scoring the the inference uh, millisecond is pretty low which is good even though it had from accuracy perspective it's not great but speed purpose perspective it was good all right so if you go to this particular site i have the sites pytorch.org you can just google it stable torch vision models they got pre-trained model for all these wonderful things image classification which is what we talked about right uh, semantic segmentation semantic segmentation you can use for medical images for figuring out where your um, the, some bad tissues are those kind of things right semantic segmentation object detection there are uh, pre-trained models which is cats whatever that you can find out where the, where some objects are and which is what is the area burning box for that object you can you have that i don't have a picture for this is a person key point detection where is your nose hand those kind of things is this a pre-trained model uh, video classification i was uh, i liked it actually if you come to the saturday course i think we will go through most of the examples as separate exercises um, if you choose to come to the saturday course but you can do it yourself too go and take a look at the models they're all pre-trained we will go through one of the demo where we'll use some simple classification models how easy is it to code and you can take it from there nlp natural language processing it's pretty hot of the press they have pytorch py transform py transformation they have released some cool code in july for nlp processing so i'm going to try to use it in my company um, but i haven't done much work on this at this point so the pre-trained models are good um, i have personally used image classification um, the other things i have not used the pre-trained models yet in production so far okay any questions 
All right, we'll just go through what, how are we doing at the time? 8 o'clock. Okay, I'll start the demos. Uh, what is PyTorch? It's Python based scientific programming language targeted as two set of audience. It's a replacement for NumPy array to use power of GPUs for doing all these wonderful calculations. And it is a deep learning research platform that provides maximum flexibility and speed. It's a research platform. And uh, that's why they ho don't have a sco good scoring system. They have Torch, Torch script and other things. I don't believe it. Um, but they're mostly they're about any paper you see in kernel library and other things. If you want to see the implementation, you'll see a PyTorch implementation. Then only you'll see other implementations. So the research community love PyTorch. And, uh, and pretty much you'll get a lot of help from that perspective. Okay, go ahead. Uh -huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can use the CPU. The question is, if I'm using a Mac and I'm I'm doing a training using CPU, later on I want to use the same code in GPU. Can you do that? Yes. You can. You can. We can set up the tensors in CPU kind of a tensors or GPU kind of a tensors, and you can train the model in GPU mode as well as a CPU mode. It, it provides both things. It's pretty strict about it. You can have to choose one of them. Okay, so that's not a problem. It'll be slow, but it's not a problem. So kind of a PyTorch workflow. It's a pretty straightforward. You have the training data, and whatever you see on the parentheses is, is the modules it uses. You create a network, which means that's the model dot nn is the one you use the models for. Uh, train network is using Torch Optim and as well as Autograd. It's one is for optimizer, another one is for uh, automatically creating gradients and wonderful things. Using those three steps, you create a train model and use the, use the train model and, and the testing data for getting the predictions, which will set the accuracy in everything for future use. That's why you predict the accuracy of the model. And for order model interoperable, interoperability, um, and this torch dot onyx, which means you can get the model, convert that into onyx model. Onyx is an open source format. Once you have that, you can use OpenVINO to create a faster uh, inference engine, or you can even create, you can move it to some other frameworks for faster inference. Okay, that's pretty much what it is. Published models, torch hub, I have not used it. For Format that you're referring to? Yeah. If I convert it into Onyx, would it be easy for me to like load that into TensorFlow and use it or put that? Yeah, yeah, you, for, for the interoperability, you can actually from the train model, you can convert to TensorFlow directly. You can go to TensorFlow directly. Um, and from TensorFlow, you can go to other things. But Onyx is the open source interoper interoperable model. The way I used it in my previous company is I trained it this way. Then Onyx, from Onyx, I convert that into Intel OpenVINO. And Intel OpenVINO creates a model which can work really, really fast with on an Intel machine. So we could get a model working, uh, doing inference in eight milliseconds. And so that's what you, you would use for production? Yeah, yeah, it's a CPU machine. I'm not talking big, big uh, GPU machine. I'm talking about a small machine in a, in, a, in a manufacturing assembly where you don't have a lot of space. And we bought an index, uh, Intel box. It's a pretty powerful machine, but it's a CPU box. One more question. Uh, so, for example, let's say you train your model using GPUs, right? And you create your model using GPUs. Can I actually use that to like the Onyx model? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I use it in CPU? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in yeah, yeah. No, no, nothing. So, remember. So zoom back. The question is, I'm training the model in GPU. Can I use CPU for scoring purpose? Yeah. Zoom back for a second. What are you doing for the training? By training, what we're doing is we are trying to find, find out the function of x with some parameters. And the reason we are doing GPU is the backward propagation, the calculation is much faster. After that, it doesn't matter. You have a bunch of weights and a, and a mathematical equation. You can basically take it and run it wherever you want. The GPU is not in the picture anymore. Fair enough. The output of this is a is a function of x, which is basically a bunch of is a is a it's a, it's a, it's a graph mathematical graph along with um, weights. So the reason I ask you that is that I've noticed that uh, tensors, so has the CUDA tensors and the CPU tensors. Yes, yes. You have to. 
you can't mix and match. You can't mix and match. So when you set up the model, you should say that this is for CPU, and the tensor should say it's for say CPU. And it'll work. It'll work. You should not confuse it. That's why. Good question. All right. Okay. So we're going to do a demo. It's already 8:15, I think. 8:05. We'll do a demo. And uh, where is uh, where is Sachin? Sachin is there. Oh, okay. All right. Good. We're there. So this is. Um, I'll start with this. I had some easy things. I think probably there is, there is a gentleman over there who is working on some um, some image medical image detection problems, and this could be useful. So this is um, the problem here is we are trying to detect a malaria, and what you see on the left hand side is affected. On the right hand side is not affected, right? I am not a doctor by any means, but by looking at this, there are some spots here, there are spots here, there is no spots, probably that is why it is not affected, okay? So it is um, that is why it is doing it. Fine, with my naked eye, I can do it. A rule of thumb, what I use in terms of image classification is what I tell people, my customers too, if a human can identify by looking at the image, the machine can do it. That is that's that's a, if a human cannot identify it, Still, the machine could do it. It's possible. <laughs> I've seen it, right? You, because you are not smart enough to see certain certain patterns. Okay. All right. So I'll go through this demo. So I'm going to log into. This is one more, an AWS machine. Uh, hope everything works. Oh, it's already here. Demo. Classification. So I got two um, Python notebooks. The first Python notebook will use a fixed convolution network method, which means it's going to freeze the convolution layers and it's going to do the training only for the last few layers. I'll walk you through the code because it's pretty intuitive um, and uh, self-explanatory. Uh, let me go through this nicely. Can everybody see this? Is this uh, the, the is better now? Can you read the code? You don't have to memorize the road. I'm just before just getting a feel of what's going on. The first step, like any Python program, we go religiously import modules. Right? Whatever modules are required, we just import it. That's done. Okay. And the problem again here is two sets of data. Affected or not defected, and we are going to detect whether it's uh, it's it's good or bad. That's what we are going to detect. And then, typically, what I haven't come to the training part yet. We are going to examine the data. That's what it is. So uh, we can actually go in here and say, okay, let me run this. I won't do the training alone. That's the only thing I won't do. Everything else I can execute. The training takes around one plus hour, right? So image directory. So there are two directories here, parasitized and unaffected. This is uh, bad cells and this is good one, right? So I can see what's inside that and uh, just look at these images for a second. And these are the PNG images, that's what it is, right? This is, these are the input images. And just because it is under this directory, it's already labeled. You see what's going on? It's labeled. This means uh, zero label means it's 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 uh, having malaria, and one label means it doesn't have malaria. And like I'm just opening some files here. So here it is. See here, this is a bad one. You can try one more if you want. This is also a bad one. So all this. This is how the data is. Okay, so far, okay, you have the data, it's all done. Then we can easily, you think PyTorch, you can try do some transformations, right? Uh, don't worry too much. Typically, when I used my last project, I just used my default. I, I didn't even do a lot of this transformation. I just threw, threw out certain things. But the bottom line here is, you are doing some random rotation here, which 
in this case it's okay for for a human tissue or cell analysis is okay even if it gets rotated a little bit it doesn't matter in my problem uh, what i had done before the random rotation was not allowed it has to be in the certain um, angle so i didn't do all those kind of things all i did was transform the center i made sure that a size equal to 224 because i made sure that in all the different sized images it cropped only the 224 by 224 image right it does all those kind of things you set up your transfers uh, it transforms it's pretty easy to do and you do create training test and validation for everything you set it up then you load the data here purposefully what i did was I loaded only less number of training data because I'm going to do a train transfer learning. I just took 30% of the data and made that as a training data set. Validation is 20%, test data set is 10%, which means less of the 40% of the data I'm not using it. Just for the heck of it, I didn't want to use all the data. So I can load the data and you can see this. For training, I run one hour, I have 8,000 images. Fair enough, which includes both the classes. Around 4,000, 4,000, that's, that's the distribution. Here is the beauty part. The model definition typically, I'll go here, I'll take a look at another sample here. It's a CIFAR classifier, right? This is how you normally write a PyTorch program. Like Keras, you define a model, usual thing, right? I'll just go through this, the same thing. See, here, you have to define a convolution network. We are setting up a convolution model, pooling, blah, 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 and other things. Then in this initial one, then you add to the forward, uh, forward pass, you add, start adding all these layers, then that becomes your whole network. It's like Keras, it's pretty straightforward to do, right? Now you come to a transfer model. All you do is, I'm going to call model equal to models dot resonate 18, pre-train equal to two. true. Boom, the model gets loaded. You don't have to know anything about the model at this point, okay? If you want to know what other models are available, because it's, it's a, see all these models are available, whatever I showed you before, right? All the pre-trained models are available. So the Resonate 18 is not giving good performance, you're okay with um, a, a slower inference engine, go for Resonate 50 or 34 or 150 to 101. 101 means it's got 101 layers, which means much more complicated uh, model. We can just build it, no issues. So I'm going to load this model, I think it's done. Um, now this, this is a statement some gentleman asking about um, CUDA and, and the CPU, right? If it is device is CUDA, then it, it just comes up with what device it is. Right now I'm using a GPU device, so I should be able to see this as GPU, type equal to CUDA. Okay, it's all done. Uh, the model, if you print out, this is how the model looks like, which pretty much is, these are all layer four, these are all um, the, basically the feature extraction layers, which we talked about before. Now let's come back to the, the final layer. This is what we need to change. The final layer FC is linear, it takes 5,011, out features is 1,000. Why do you think the out, output features is 1,000? What is that? Thousand categories. Yes, the ImageNet has thousand classes, thousand categories. Because pre remember, this was trained for ImageNet, and they had to classify thousand classes. That's why they kept it. But we don't care. We want only two classes, right? Good or bad. That's all we need to do. So what we do here is this is what we do. We, we got the model in. This is this is just output. We don't have to write all these kind of things. We just know what it is. Then what we say here is model dot parameters. We say require underscore grad equal to false, which means there's no grade, gradient calculation required. There's no backward propagation, which means all these parameters are fixed. Nothing gets changed during backward propagation. So we just fix everything, which means they fixed everything. Then what we do is the final layer, we add this. We add a ReLU dropout and we add a softmax, basically we get a two layer output. That's a two, two point output of the probabilities not probabilities, we do two points output, then you can figure out which one is minimum or maximum and figure out what class it is. That's what we need to do, okay? Models? Yeah, it's, it is, I, I do uh, directly on models, right? Let's go back and check what it is. Here it is, it's part of Torch Vision. Fair enough? 
The question is where is this model is coming from? It is part of torch which is PyTorch, we should they have provided this right which is good. All right. Yeah. Gradient updates, I thought the transfer model is still supposed to update the last layers. Yes. Add good question. The question is uh, you turned off the parameters gradient for all the parameters, and then where is the transfer learning happening, right? If we see this at this point, model has some FC and we turned off all the parameters. Then we changed the lot FC layer to this one. As a default, whenever you start defining a layer, the gradients are turned on. Okay, and uh, you can even check it. Right? Did I do this? So, so we can actually check it. Let me verify that. And I should be able to see this, right? Um, doing a list comprehension here. Uh, will this work? This should work, right? No. What do you do? What is that again? Sorry. Oh, you're right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So it says S for everything. Hmm. Should have false, right? Let me see. Let us not spend too much on time on this and just that is ok. All right, just trust me it works. Uh, I am not going to do the training now ok. Um, it basically freezes all those things and the rest of the ones should be true. Um, the optimizer setting, criterion setting is all loss everything, it is all done. Then the training is the usual training, I would not go through the code. Um, the gentleman asked me about this uh, CUDA, this is what you do, all the tensors you should take set to the right device. If it is CPU, it will be set to CPU. If it is GPU, it will set to GPU. That is important. Um, that is pretty much it. Here also you should do the same thing. Those are the only two nuances I guess thought about. Everything else is pretty straightforward. The good thing about um, a PyTorch, if you are not using transfer learning, you have a chance to define your own backward propagation. All those things you can do it very easily yourself. It is very easy to do. Okay. So far the code is pretty straightforward, it ran, it trained for uh, 20 epochs, this is how it looks like, the training loss came down, the validation loss also is going down, I can probably go for some more epochs, but we stopped here. Um, then let me go here and this is where the accuracy, precision, recall and F1 scores were used using the test data and if you see the accuracy, accuracy was 93 percent. It is pretty good, right? I did not use all the data, I used transfer learning, only the last two layers, and I got a pretty decent accuracy of 93 percent overall. So, ultimately, I want a probability as an output, right? Or even ReLU also will work, it is not a problem. Um, you need a fully connected layer, you want to get the, you want to flatten the information coming out of a, uh, uh, sorry, the question is why, how did you choose this by the fully connected layer, right? The last few layers. Um, this is pretty much a standard thing people use whenever they want to come out of CN. This is the one, right? This is, I know what I am talking about. 
oh you can do you can sequential basically means that the output of this goes to the next one that is the only thing it means right that that is the only thing if you want to define it in a different way that is ok that is what I think ok. Uh, the key here is the in features is important in features is the number of output inputs coming in from the previous layer right whatever it is that that changes from network to network. So, you basically take it from you see that I took it from the this 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 program took it from fc dot in features which means came from the pre trained model that is important it changes from uh, network to network. Then you say that I want to have a 512 node uh, fully connected layer um, the activation for that is uh, relu dropout is just a, a feature for um, uh, doing a better job in uh, not allowing overfit. And then you have from uh, linear 512 to then you go to two, two nodes that is pretty much what it is. And you can change that number 512 to anything else to see how it behaves it is fine. That is pretty much it. Um, so, how difficult do you think it is to get this kind of uh, things done? Yeah, yeah. There are lots of code available. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not in the same format. I also took this code most of certain things from other places, but this particular code is right now with me. So, I can give it to you. I think um, from ACM perspective people want you to come to the Saturday course. So, <laughs> so if you come to the course we will give you the code I think you will have at least 4 to 5 labs where we will try all the different pre trained models right that is pretty much it go ahead. I did not hear that ok. No I did not hear that sorry. Oh, this one? Oh, this one I am using uh, P2 X large. That is around, it, it, it cost me around close to a dollar per hour. Okay. And if you use G2, that is really, really bad. It is a previous generation GPU, it is very, very slow. Um, I think whatever AWS says they are giving us, I do not think they are giving us. To be honest, if I have a PC in my home, it works really, really fast. So, if you have a PC, a decent PC with one uh, 1080 PI, the game thing, whatever GPU, that works very, very fast. Okay. Any other questions? Go ahead. So, you can use uh, the No, I did not hear that. Tensor board? No, I have not. Why for seeing your um, this one. Those are all fancy things. <laughs> yeah, so, so the question is can you use tensor board with uh, PyTorch? Um, yeah, as long as you can see the graph where where the activations are happening, it is good. I have not used it. Sorry. If if you want to classify them into uh, different types of diseases or different conditions, right? Conditions then you have to train them accordingly you can do that. And in some situation you do not want to even want to say whether it is good or not you want it to locate the problem. Then you start using image segmentation. So, it will actually draw, put a circle around it will actually show where the where the problems are, but you had to the, then the, you had to go through the painful process of like creating the label data it is very important yeah, you have to create that. Once you do that, it will do the job for you. If for image segmentation, there are pre trained models available. Yeah, yeah. The question is can we use the C wrapper for PyTorch? I think it is underneath that. The, the, I will tell you the solution what we used for the previous company, which was manufacturing defect detection, going from a solution perspective, right? Our job was to detect 40 images per second. If you divide 40 images per second, what happens? Like um, 1000 multiplied divided by 40, it comes to 25 milliseconds that is what the number is for the whole end to end 25 millisecond out of which for scoring you probably will get 10 or 15 12 because you need some pre processing you need some pro processing all those things take enough time right. There is a lot of delays inefficiency built in there. So, you are given only 10 millisecond such so your goal right. Then you have to have a model which can do the scoring for that. So, training I can do wherever I want I can use TensorFlow I can use PyTorch I can use CAFE it does not really matter. Finally, I had to come up with a model which can run fast. So, we chose OpenVINO. 
because we are going to use the Intel box. So, OpenVINO can actually take any model, convert that, it will have, it will convert that to using MKL libraries and everything. So, it can run really, really fast. So, that is that is how we came with the pipeline. So, we know we have to get a model out which can be used with OpenVINO. I trade Keras and uh, that is the two months effort I was telling you, right. We did all those kind of things and finally, OpenVINO, we, we had connection to all the uh, lab and other people. They came back and said that we could not convert this, pro they converted properly, but it was not producing good fast results. What the hell is going on, right? Supposed to produce 25x or 30x, it is not happening. They came back and said that you have to start from TensorFlow. If you start from Keras, there are some problems. So, these kind of, so we are actually working for a customer, right? If you encounter these kind of problems, you are credible, you have, you are running against time, right? So, we were really worried what to do. Um, so, I, I started doing using straight TensorFlow. Can we do the using straight TensorFlow? Again, the, the pre trained models, I think somehow Google's approach with pre trained model was they want us to use their own APIs. We do not want that. We want the model so that we are completely detached from the framework, right? There was some confusion going on there. I haven't gone back and checked what they have done. So, I just start playing around with PyTorch. They gave us a beautiful model. We get a very good accuracy with, uh, with less number of images. And from PyTorch, you can convert, I think the code for converting that into Onyx is this one. I have not shown the whole thing now. So, this is the open neural network exchange Onyx and I take the model, I convert that into a CPU based model. This is one, one command, export the model. Now, it has got a dot Onyx file and if you go to OpenVINO, they have programs which will take an Onyx file which will show you on, on, on Saturday and convert that into OpenVINO model. Boom. All the, once it goes to OpenVINO, OpenVINO does not care about how you created the model and other things. Everything is divorced from each other. So, you have to go for the best possible framework for creating the best possible optimized model. The best possible uh, framework for running your inference. No, the only models I have seen here is what I listed below was it has a video. Yeah, yeah. Whatever I listed there, there is a video. Uh, pre-trained model is there and you can go the go to that website and check it out where is that uh, here it is pytorch.org docs stable slash torch vision slash models dot html you can go here open link see the classification they got classification let us go all the way down Two plus one D mixed convolution video video classification. So we'll do a lab on this on Saturday. So they have. I was surprised to see this too, right? Uh, they were they did, and huh? Much better than TensorFlow, like you're saying. TensorFlow deep mind is hiding all the stuff underneath TensorFlow. Yeah, yeah. So as I was explaining him, everything is divorced from each other. Once we create the model, I do not want to, I do not care about PyTorch at all, right. Once I have the model, I want to go and deploy it wherever I want and that is very important. We do not want to be tied to any particular framework, then it becomes a problem. Oh, there is, uh, yeah, we will do and the, the Py transforms, they are calling themselves as the next um, um, ImageNet for MLP. So, we will explore that area, MLP, NLP area, because that is very fascinating area and if, if you are uh, trying to learn into a good data science career, NLP is pretty hot, very, very hot at this point. If because it is the NLP applications will go to regular businesses for chatbot, uh, customer service, um, reading PDF documents reading all of email communication. That is what people do all the time in a regular business. Everything will get automated in the next 5 to 10 years, trust me. And there will be a lot of applications rolled out and the business, the way people do business will change. And NLP will play a huge, huge role. Any other question? Okay. All right, so 8.30. Um, I had a few other demos. I think I went through most of it. 
Okay, so yet I talked about open beam. This is this is the result. After all this training and everything, um, this is what it's doing. It did the. This is all the holdout data set. This was not used in in um, training. It got this right. This a this has got the two the whatever it is. This has got the defect. This has got the malaria again. Malaria, yes. And here it is parasites. And here prediction is un unaffected. This is a good one. And here this is a false positive. It thinks it is it is having a problem. You can see that why. Right? There's a small spot here. It's actually unaffected. So this this probably will be a uh, false positive. Again, it's unaffected. This is good. Here also it is saying it is it is positive because probably it's looking at these defects. Um, but actually it is not. It's unaffected, 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 unaffected. So not bad. Okay. All right. Um, what else do we want to go through? That's pretty much it. I'll open up for questions um, in terms of any specific problems you want to talk about. I have other things, but it is uh, we'll reserve that to Saturday. Yeah. I've seen people. I heard people done it. I have not done it myself. What they did was they took the graph. What about the graph? Actual graph. That's a two diverse image. They used it as a for training. Yeah, I, I heard people did. I don't know how successful they were. They were actually taking the images as a two dimensional image, not a time series data, even though it has that uh, this one. Then they were feeding it for training purposes. So try it out. Let's see what happens. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Great. If there is nothing else, I will stop my presentation. Thank you for listening. <laughs>